economics. We're going to study that when we come back from our break. Economics. We're going to cover, especially for the kids today, how to become financially independent. We're going to let the adults listen. I've been teaching kids for the last 18, 19 years how to be rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright. Most kids think they're extra bright. They go for 35 or much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. We're going to get into that. Be a student of economics. Next, culture, sophistication. Don't leave that out of your life. Culture, sophistication. Culture is part of the fabric of the nation. Culture is what makes us different than dogs and animals. Culture is what makes us different from the barbarians. Culture, sophistication. Be a student of the dance and the art and the music and all the rest of those extraordinary human values that are possible for us all to participate in as well as to enjoy. Be a student of culture. And the last one is spirituality. Study it from the Bible and all the related books about spirituality. If you're a believer, study and practice. Let your library show you're a serious student. Next, keep a journal. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, not only be a student, but the good ideas that you develop from the books. Keep a separate journal. Write all this stuff down. Here's what he said. Don't trust your memory. If you're serious about becoming wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy, and influential, and cultured, unique, keep a journal. Don't trust your memory. If you listen to something valuable, write it down. If you come across something important, write it down, write it down. Now, I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats and long sheets and narrow sheets and little sheets and pieces and thrown in a drawer. Found out, best way, keep a journal. I've been keeping these journals now since age 25. It makes up a valuable part of my own learning and it's a valuable part of my library. My own journals now form a good portion of my own library. The stuff. I'm trying to get kids to do like I do, be a buyer of empty books. Kids find it interesting I'd buy an empty book. Especially at my status in life. What did I pay for this one? $26. <laughs> kids say, $26 for an empty book. Why would you do that? Well, the reason I paid $26 is to press me to see if I can't find something worth $26 to put in here. And I'm telling you, all my journals are private. But if you got a hold of one of my journals, you wouldn't have to look very far until you would say, this is worth more than $26. I must admit, if you got a glimpse of Mr. Rohn's journals, you'd have to say he is a serious student. Not just committed to his craft, but committed to life, committed to skills committed to learning, to see what I can do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain and miracle and possibilities and turn it into equities of life and treasure, family relationships, enterprise, sales, management, gifts galore, everything you want, all available, especially in America. I'm asking you, keep a journal. I call it one of the three treasures to leave behind. Let me give you that. One of the three treasures to leave behind. Number one is your pictures. Take a lot of pictures. Did you ever look back, right? Two or three generations, just a handful of photographs way back there. Wouldn't it be something if there was album after album, thousands of pictures to help tell the story? A picture's worth a thousand words. Don't be lazy in capturing the event. How long does it take to capture the event? A fraction of a second. How long does it take to miss the event? A fraction of a second. Errors in judgment or disciplines, take lots of pictures, help tell the story. Click, click, got it, click, click, got it, keep. I go to Taiwan to lecture, Taipei, Taiwan. Grand Hotel, neat place to do a weekend seminar. I got a thousand students. Guess how many cameras? 1,000 cameras. They all bring their cameras. They wouldn't miss the event, take pictures. Takes me more time to take pictures than it does to do the lectures. 
Here's my new American friend. Here's my new American friend. Click, click, save it. Got it. Thousand words, each one. What a scenario. Don't miss the pictures. When you're gone, one of the things to leave behind, the treasure in picture as well as in words. See? Next, your library. The library that you gathered, that taught you, that instructed you, that helped you to defend your ideals, that helped you to develop a philosophy, that helped you to become wealthy and powerful and healthy and sophisticated and unique. The library that helped you conquer some disease. The library that helped you to conquer poverty. The library that caused you to walk away from the ghetto. The library, the books that instructed you, fed your mind and fed your soul. Leave your library behind. One of the greatest gifts you can leave behind is your library. Stepping stones out of the darkness into the light. Your library. So leave your books behind. Your books will be more valuable than your couch. Your books. Books, books. And third is your journals. The ideas that you picked up. The notes you took at seminars like this. Wherever you found an occasion to gather something valuable and put it in here so you could go back over it and go back over it. Repetition is the mother of skill. Read it one more time. Learn it one more time. See if you can't digest it one more time. Let it coach you one more time. Let it teach you one more time. Let it inspire you one more time. Words are inspirational. The lyrics of a song. And not just read it once. That's why we put our stuff on cassettes so you can go through it again and again and again. If you hear a beautiful song that does something to you, you don't say, well, that's enough. Don't need to hear that again. No. Wouldn't you want to hear it again, hear it again, hear it again? Let it instruct you. Let it feed you. Let it teach you. Take you on wings of emotional journeys wouldn't you want to do that again the answer is yes that's what's so important and here's what's important one of the things to leave behind that's your journals all the stuff you took the meticulous time to gather one of the greatest proofs that you are a serious student taking pictures that's pretty easy buying a book at a bookstore that's pretty easy here's one that's a little more challenging be student enough of your own life and your own future and your own destiny be student enough to take the time to keep the notes and keep the journal. You'll be so glad you did. What a treasure to leave behind when you go. Your journals. I wouldn't be without mine now. I'm in Carmel, California, one of my favorite places. It's where I wrote my first book called Seasons of Life. I went to this little church one Sunday morning. First time I'd been there. A little small church, I don't know, 150 people classic sermon that morning classic sermon one of the best I've ever heard in all of my life I happened to be there and I had my journal while this sermon is going on I can't believe it was so precise it was so unique it was so powerful and I've got my journal and I'm taking notes taking notes of this classic sermon now guess how many other people were taking notes Approximately, guess. How many do you suppose? It looked like, best as I could tell, I'm the only one taking notes of this classic sermon. Now, since I'm a stranger there, and it's the first time I've been there, and I'm taking these notes, people started looking, who is he, and what's he doing? I started feeling just a little bit uncomfortable. I'm still writing. Now I'm feeling kind of like a spy, right? I could hear some of them say, he's going to get out of here with some of this stuff. And I did. I did. I'm the guy that walked away with the stuff. I'm asking you to be no less sincere and be no less committed to the advancement of your philosophy, the set of the sale. Talk about have your best year ever this year and then get ready for next year, your very best year ever. And they'll start being the best, the best, the best year after year. If you'll commit yourself to some of this simple stuff called personal development, start with a walk around the block. Start with the refinement of your philosophy. Start with the teaching of your own fabulous mind where all the answers are. I can only give you a few answers from my own experience. The rest of all the magical answers are within the confines of your own mind, but it takes the books takes the cassettes, takes the videos, personal conversation, sermons, lyrics from songs, dialogue from the movie. Let your heart be stirred by words. Find ways to capture. 
part of your personal development quest. Now here's the last subject on personal development just before we take our break. Isn't this good stuff? I'm telling you, this stuff changed my life. Turned me every way but loose. I've never been the same since the teacher gave me some of this simple instruction. How to go from where you are to where you want to go. How to go from what you are to what you want to become. How to go from pennies to treasure. How to go from nothing to fortune. It's all within the confines of this stuff that I've been trying to share with you. Laboring best I can. Words are clumpy when you try to in your head, your experience. But I'm doing my best today. And I'm excited about it. Appreciate you taking all these good notes. I'm good students today. I appreciate that. Develop these five abilities as part of your personal development quest. I call them the five abilities. Here's the first one. Develop the ability to absorb. The ability to soak it up like you're doing today. Be like a sponge. Don't miss anything. And not just the words. It's true. Don't miss the words. But don't miss the atmosphere. Don't miss the color. Don't miss the scenario. Don't miss what's going on. Most people are just trying to get through the day. Here's what I want you to be committed to do. Learn to get from the day. Don't just get through it, get from it. Learn from it. Let the day teach you. Join the university of life. What a difference that'll make in your future. Commit yourself to learning. Commit yourself to absorbing. Be like a sponge. Get it. Don't miss it. I've got a personal friend of mine who's so gifted in this area. I think he has soaked up and remembers everything that's ever happened to him. He can tell you as a teenager where he was and what he did and what he said and what she said and how they felt and the color of the sky and what was going on that day. And the reason is because he gets it, he gets it, he gets it. I'm telling you, it's more exciting to have him go to Acapulco, come back and tell you about it than it is to go yourself. He's unbelievable. He's got this extraordinary gift. And why is it? When he's there, he doesn't miss anything. Here's a good phrase for you to jot down. Wherever you are, be there. Be there to absorb it up. Be there to soak it up. Take a picture if you can. But take pictures of your mind. Let your soul and heart take pictures. Get it. Capture it. Absorb it. It's such an important ability to develop, the ability to get it, don't miss it. Don't be casual in getting it. Key phrase, casualness leads to casualties. Second, learn to respond. The ability to respond means let life touch you. Don't let it kill you, but let it touch you. Let sad things make you sad. Let happy things make you happy. I'm telling you, give in to the emotion. Let the emotion strike you, not just the words, not just the image. Let the feeling strike you. Let the emotion strike you. Here's what's important. Our emotions need to be as educated as our intellect. Our emotions need to be educated as well as our intellect. It's important to know how to feel. It's important to know how to respond. It's important to let life in, let it touch you. I'm the greatest guy in the world to take to the movies. I get into a good movie. I want a good movie. Make me laugh, make me cry, scare me to death. Teach me something. Take me high, take me low. Just don't leave me as I was when I came in. Touch me, do something to me. I picked up the newspaper in Australia. The advertisement says, see Dr. Zhivago on the big screen. I said, my gosh, I gotta go see it on the big screen. I'd seen it, you know, two or three times before, but the big screen, I love the old theaters, right? The balconies and the chandeliers and the draperies and all this stuff, the big screen. 
So I go one more time, see Dr. Zhivago, and sure enough, I'm swept away one more time. Story of the Russian Revolution, Dr. Zhivago, and that whole scenario. I had always missed the importance of the ending of that movie until this time. The other times I missed it. I'm telling you, this time, I got it. Comrade General said, Tanya, how did you come to be lost? After he would found her, right? Said, how did you come to be lost? And she said, well, I was just lost. He said, no, how did you come to be lost? She said, well, we were, you know, the city was on fire when we were running to escape and I was lost. He said, no, how did you come to be lost? And that's what she didn't want to say. He finally pressed her again. How did you come to be lost? And he said, well, she said, well, while we were running through the city and it was on fire, my father let go of my hand and I was lost. That's what she didn't want to say. Comrade General said, Tanya, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Komarovsky was not your real father. He was not. I'm telling you, I've been looking all over for you, and I think I found you. This man, my relative, Dr. Zhivago, the poet, I'm telling you, he was your father. And Comrade General said, Tanya, I promise you this. If this man, your real father, had been there, I promise you, he would never have let go of your hand. This time I got it. The other times I'm eating popcorn waiting for the movie to finish. I mean, this time I got it. I got it. I'm asking you to get it. Absorb and respond. Maybe you heard the story about the, the evangelist here in Texas way back in the horse and buggy days. Used to put up his uh, tent in you know, these various Texas towns and hold tent revivals. And he put up his tent, one of these towns, expected a big crowd to come and hear him preach. And he got there first night of the tent revival, and he walked inside the tent, it was empty. And he thought, something must be wrong. He waited till 8 o'clock, nobody showed up. He waited till 8.15, not a soul. Finally, 8.30, one lone cowboy. Wandered up on his horse, tied his horse up outside, came in, sat down on the front bench, big empty tent. So the preacher thought, well, at least I better go down and talk to the cowboy. So he goes down and talks to the cowboy and he says, cowboy, I don't know what to tell you. He said, I'm the preacher. And this tent was supposed to be full of people. And he said, something's gone wrong. I really don't know what to do. I'm embarrassed. And he said, I don't know what to do. And the cowboy said, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm just a cowboy, so I can't tell you what to do. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd at least feed it. So uh, <clears throat> the preacher said, hey, the cowboy is right. If you've got a message to share, if there's one person or a thousand, don't let your ego get in the way. You know, you should do the best you can. So he got kind of inspired by this conversation with the cowboy, jumped up on the platform, started preaching as if the tent was full of people. And he was so inspired, he just kept going, kept going, went for an hour, went for an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. Finally, wound down and quit. Come down off the platform, talked to the cowboy again, said, well, cowboy, what did you think of my sermon? <clears throat> cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher, so I can't really tell. I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this. If I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd feed it, but I wouldn't dump the whole load on it. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> if it seems like we're dumping the whole load here today, I guess we really are. But you guys are working hard. Does anybody have four pages of notes? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, my job, I'm getting it done, wonderful. We should give a prize one of these days for the most notes. Fantastic. I congratulate you, you're working as hard as I am, I appreciate that. Okay, we got some more work to do, so let's go to work. Everybody, it's okay, say I'm okay. All right, I'd love to take you with me as my traveling audience. Wow. We've covered the first two abilities in the personal development quest. 
One is the ability to absorb, don't miss anything, pay attention. Good watchword for the 90s, pay attention. Things are moving so fast these days, you gotta pay attention, pick it up, soak up the colors, soak up the sounds, soak up what's going on. Second, respond, let life touch you. Let the emotions affect you as well as the sights. Now here's the third ability, develop the ability to reflect. Reflect means go back over, study it again. Go back over these notes that you're taking today. Go back through the cassettes one more time. Read the text one more time. But there's more to it than that. Go back over your day. I call it run the tapes again. So that the day locks in firmly. Here's some good times to reflect. One at the end of the day. Take a few minutes at the end of the day. Go back over the day. Who'd you see and what'd they say and what happened? How'd you feel? What went on? so that you capture that day. A day is a piece of the mosaic of your life. Number one, don't treat it casual. Number two, get from the day. And then number three, go back over the day so that it locks in that experience, the knowledge, the sights, the sounds, the panorama, the color motion picture of the day. Just lock it in so that it will serve you for the future, having that day, not missing it. Next. Take a few hours at the end of the week. Call time to reflect. Go back over your day timer. Go back over your calendar. Go back over your appointment book. Where did you go and who did you see and how did it feel and what went on? Capture that week. A week is a pretty good chunk of time. Next. Take half a day at the end of the month. Call time to reflect. And do the same thing again. Go back over what you read. Go back over what you heard. Go back over what you saw. Go back over the feelings to capture it so that it serves you. Next, take a weekend at the end of the year to establish this year now firmly in your consciousness, firmly in your experience bank so that you've got it, so that it never disappears. Good ability to acquire, the ability to reflect. Go back over, remember, remember, remember. It's so valuable to be able to remember the thought, remember the idea, remember the experience, remember the occasion, remember the day, remember the weather, remember the emotion, remember the complexity, remember the highs, remember the lows. So valuable at the end of the day, Lock that day in, lock the month in, lock the week in, lock the year in. Old Testament says, a unique scenario unfolded according to the law. And that was they worked nine years and the 10th year was a sabbatical. The 10th year, work nine, take the 10th year and not just to relax, not just to replenish, not maybe just to get physically in shape, change of pace, we call it in the modern society, but not just for that. I'm sure that in ancient days, that sabbatical was to go over the last nine years, what went right and what went wrong and what worked well and what didn't work well. And how did you grow and how did you learn and how did you change and what have you got now after nine years that you didn't have at the beginning of the nine years? See, that's so valuable, a sabbatical. A sabbatical, some time, some time. There's also something to be said for solitude when you reflect. Sometimes you can reflect with somebody. Husband and wife reflect on the past year, right? Parents reflect with their children on the past year. How did we do it and how didn't we do it and how could we improve? Colleagues can reflect with each other. But now here's one of the most important. You got to learn to reflect with yourself. There's something to be said for solitude. There's something to be said for taking those occasions to shut out the world and shut out everything else for a while, for a while. I've got a motor home, that's how I do. With my motorcycle on the back. And I head for the mountains and ride the Jeep trails. 
where there's very few human beings on the jeep trails or out in the desert somewhere. It's called my time to get away. When you live a very public life, you treasure solitude. A chance to reflect, go back over my life, go back over my skills, go back over my experiences. Alone, alone. There are some things you need to do alone. Ponder, think, wonder, read, study, absorb, soak in. See if you can't become better this year than you were last year. Better the next nine than you were the first nine. Solitude. There's even a more modern advice that says, go to the closet for time of meditation time of prayer go to the closet closet meaning what away and there's even a graphic description of the away it said enter into your closet and what got some students here I'm sure what close the door <laughs> for what just to shut out everything Life is experience, 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 and touching and seeing and looking and doing and acting and disciplines and all the stuff. But sometimes, this is where this reflecting is so important, to shut the door, to shut the door and wonder, prayer, contemplation, thinking, and let things move in to your consciousness and awareness that no other way can it be done, right? Flying down the freeway, I'm telling you, it's difficult to get through. So many things to do, it's difficult to get through. But times of solitude, times to reflect. So this is so valuable, learn to reflect. Now here's why it's important to reflect. To make the past more valuable to serve you for the future. Here's what's really powerful, learning to gather up the past and invest it in the future. Gather up today and invest it in tomorrow. Gather up this week and invest it in the next week. Gather up this year and invest it in the next year. See, that's so powerful. Rather than just hanging on one more year, hanging in there, seeing what's going to happen. Learn, study. This is part of the personal development quest. Becoming better than you are, more valuable than you are. Not just in terms of economics, in terms of motherhood, in terms of fatherhood, in terms of being a better brother, a better colleague, making a better contribution to the family, to society, to the community, to the church, to the office, to the commitment, to the partnership. Doesn't matter what it is that has value. Work on yourself, then you bring more value to the partnership, to the marriage, to the franchise, to the corporation, to the enterprise, to the community, to the nation. Self-development, personal development. The best contribution you can make to someone else is self-development, not self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice only earns contempt. Self-development earns respect. Pity the mother who says, I'm just gonna give up my life for my children. Self-sacrifice is not noble. Self-investment is noble from self-development. If I work on myself and become more valuable, think of what that'll do for our friendship. I used to use the old expression, you take care of me and I'll take care of you. I found out how shallow and short-ended that was. And I changed it to read like this, I'll take care of me for you. If you will please take care of you for me. And this is part of it, the personal development that we work harder on ourselves than we do on our job. Now we bring that to the friendship. Now we bring that to the marriage. Now we bring that to the family relationship as a father, as a mother. And we develop the strength and we develop the power. That's key. And it takes, I think, this scenario of disciplines, these abilities, to acquire those gifts and those skills, that value, so that we bring more. Now, we bring more to the next week, we bring more to the next month, we bring more to the next year. If you follow this, absorb, respond, and reflect. I said to my father, when he was about to turn 76, his 76th birthday, I said, dear father of mine, can you imagine what it's gonna be like to gather up the last 75 years of your life and invest them in your 76th year? What a difference of philosophy, rather than just hanging on one more year. Gather up 75 and invest them in the next one. Gather up the last six years and invest it in the next year. See, that's so powerful in communication, which we're gonna study soon, so powerful. So consider this, one, the ability to absorb, second, the ability to respond, third, the ability to reflect. 
Here's number four, develop the ability to act. Take action. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. You say, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you got to do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto, action immediate, action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold. A year from now, can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. Says, right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before, before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, gotta take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity, capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. Now, here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Okay. We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. Key to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal and you won't take pictures and then you won't do this. You won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Key. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth, self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. One neglect leads to another. 
And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline, okay? Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited. You'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The disciplines to do it, take action. I recommended the last time I was here, the little book, Richest Man in Babylon, and I said, I've lectured now to over three million people in the last 33 years, and I've recommended this little book to almost all of them, I think. Guess how many have actually gone and got this little book? Answer, very few. My best guess is 10%. Such an easy thing to do. In that last seminar, right, I suggested this little book, number one, is easy to find. Number two, it's easy to buy. The most you can pay for it, six, seven, eight dollars. You can borrow that from your kids. And number three, it's easy to read. It's in story form. That's why I use it for teenagers, teaching them how to be rich by 40, 35, if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. But if it's easy to find and easy to buy, and if it's easy to read, why wouldn't everybody go get it? We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. Here's how profound it is. Some do and some don't. Now here's the numbers. About 10% do. 90% don't or won't. And we don't know the mystery of that. And I'm telling you, 10 years from now, those numbers will still be the same. 10% will, 90% won't. The numbers don't change, only the faces change. You're looking at one of the faces. I used to belong to the 90% who couldn't be bothered even if it was easy. Guess how many people have a library card? Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life in any value amount you want. By the way, how much is a library card in Texas? Free, here's what free is. Easy. I mean, it can't be any easier than free. Somebody says, well, would you bring it by? Well, no, at least you got to go get it. No. Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life spiritually, socially, personally, economically, and every other way. Teach you how to be rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy, influential. How many people have a library card? Answer, 3%. 95, 97% couldn't be bothered. Guy specializes in happy hour, but he doesn't have a card. And now readily and quickly blames the government and blames his company and blames policy and blames the pay scale. When if he only knew, if he joined the 3%, here's my advice to you today, walk away from the 97%. Don't talk like they talk. Don't act like they act. Don't go where they go. Don't specialize in what they specialize in. Throw away the blame list they cling to. Start you a new life. You say, well, is it as simple as getting a library card and join the 3%? And the answer is, of course, of course. That's how easy this stuff is. This is so easy. It's so simple. It's not complex. You don't need a 2,000-year-old guru. You don't need multi-track affirmations. I'm telling you, don't. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. Key. Don't let somebody sweep you into some contrary way to nature itself, says, unless you labor the miracle of the seed and the soil and the seasons and God and all the other stuff that's available, sunshine and rain, that's not available to you by affirmation. It is only available to you by labor. So labor well. 
learn well discipline yourself well and you can have all the treasures you want this stuff's easy and simple it's not ocean waves and seagulls you don't have to move to sedona where all the force fields come together in arizona Let's teach our kids the simple ways to transform their health, number one, their economics, number two, their ability to communicate, number three, their life and treasure and lifestyle, number four, spirituality, number five, and the list goes on and on. Let's not leave out any of the least of disciplines that encourage us to do the next one, to do the next one, to do the next one. First thing you know, this whole scenario for you is spinning up instead of out of control on the negative side. This is all you got to do. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as a start, committing yourself to life change. And once you start down this road, I promise you, you'll join the 10% and the 3%. We're gonna talk financial independence in just a little while. Guess how many people can retire from the income of their own personal resources when it comes time to retire? Answer, 5%. In the most independent country in the world, 95% are dependent, 5% are independent. Take charge of your own retirement. I'm telling you, if you take charge of your own retirement through personal development and all these skills we've taught today, plus what's coming up, financial independence, I'm telling you, take charge of your own retirement, you can multiply it at least by five, maybe by 10, maybe by 20, maybe by 100. Let the government take care of it, some company take care of it, you got to divide by five. Take charge of your own life, take charge of your own day, take charge of your own conversation, take charge of your own family, take charge of your own possibilities. And learn these skills, develop this kind of strategy, and I'm telling you, life will open up for you. Join the 3%, join the 10%, join the 5%, walk away from the 95%. In our Leadership Weekend we teach, find out what poor people read and don't read it. I'm telling you, don't talk like they talk. Lend a helping hand, but don't fall into the, their poor philosophical scenario. Don't blame what they blame. Don't use the excuses they use. It's called the language of the poor. Switch gears, switch language, switch ideas, switch strategy. Start with the simplest of disciplines. And don't be mean any of these disciplines. The smallest of disciplines starts the process of life change. And if you'll invest in this thing called discipline, you can have whatever you wish. It's called the beginning of a miracle. Now here's the last clue on discipline. Do the best you can. We covered earlier, but here's a good scenario for the do the best you can. I've got a good question for you. Is the best you can do all you can do? And the answer is no. Strangely enough, if we all fell on the floor right now and did as many push-ups as we possibly could, and let's say for some reason, you haven't been into push-ups lately, I can't imagine why, but let's say. And let's say the best you can do is five. And you look up at the rest of us and say, hey, five is the best I can do. We can tell by the look on your face, that's probably true. Five is the best you can do. Now is five all you can do? The answer is no. If you rest a little, you can do five more. Wow. And if you rest a little, you can do five more. And if you rest a little, you can do 15 more. How did we get from five to 15? It's a miracle. And if you rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 20. How did you get from five to 20? It's a miracle. Did you know you can keep doing that? Do a little more, rest a little, do a little more, rest a little, and finally get up to 50 push-ups? Is it possible to get up to 50 push-ups? Of? Of course. How do you go from five to 50? It's a miracle. How do you get a miracle going? Number one, do what you can. Don't leave out what you can from writing a letter to your mother in Florida. Start cleaning it all up. Two, doing the push-ups. Go from five to 50. It's a miracle. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here's number three, rest very little. Don't rest too long. Why? The weeds take the garden. Kids have got that figured out. You can't rest too long. Here's the clue. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to act. 
Think of more disciplines. Think of more ways and means in which to use your own wisdom and your own philosophy and use your own attitude, your own faith, your own courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of discipline. Thereby transform your life. Join the 5%, join the 10%, join the 3%. Guess when I went and got this little book, Richest Man in Babylon? The same day I heard about it. I went and got it. Somebody says, well, Mr. Owen, does that make you different than most other people? And the answer is yes. Somebody says, well, why is that? We don't know. We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. None of us knows. Some do and some don't. The numbers don't change. Only the faces change. From those who get in on a seminar like this, listen to a dynamic sermon, read a book, listen to some cassettes, take seriously the next conversation of a friend who wants to level with you and do something about it. And you can walk away from the 97% and not live there anymore. Because if you don't, the next six years of your life will be like the last six. Mr. Shove said to me, Mr. Rohn, six years now you've been working. I'm telling you, the next six years of your life is going to be like the last six unless you take advantage and start making these personal changes. I made the changes, totally revolutionized my life. So take a look at the next five years of your life. It's going to be like the last five unless, 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 unless you change. And if you will change, everything will change. Join the 5%. 10 years from now, the numbers are going to be the same. But I'm telling you, some faces in this audience can change and start showing up in the 3% crowd and the 5% crowd and the 10% crowd and thereby dynamically affect your life and your future. Develop these strengths. Now here's the last ability. Develop the ability to share. Pass along to someone else. If you've picked up a good idea today, pass it along. Don't let it stay. Pass it along. A book, if you take one of these little books I've suggested at home and it affects you, pass along. Say, hey, I found a book. Really helped me. I found a book. Got me thinking. I found a book. Changed my health. I found a book. Got me inspired. Pass it along. Pass it along. Pass it along. Here's what's exciting about sharing. If you share with 10 different people, they get to hear it once. You get to hear it 10 times. So it's probably going to do more for you than it is for them. But it's called what? Everybody wins. When somebody shares, everybody wins. Wow. Share your ideas, share your experiences, share your knowledge. You can have just as much pleasure as I do. I said, giving this seminar, this is one of my joys in life. Give a seminar like this, make the best investment I can of words and spirit and heart and soul and time, energy. I don't have to work this hard. But I gladly work this hard. Why? I want the return. Your words touch my life. See, that's heavyweight stuff. You can't buy it with money. But I'm telling you, you can get the same thing started by recommending a book. Somebody will read that book and then they'll read another one and they'll read another one and they'll come to you someday and say, you got me started. That book you recommended turned my lights on, turned my mind around, got me thinking, got me pondering, and I've been on track ever since. You can get just as much praise as I do if you'll share, share with your children, share with your colleagues, share with everybody that comes within your grasp, share. Now here's what sharing does. Not only helps you, helps the person you share with, here's what else it does. Makes you bigger than you are. If I had a glass of water up here and it was full, question, can that glass hold any more water? If it's full, if the glass is full, can it hold any more water? The answer is yes. But for it to hold more, you've got to pour out what's already in. That's what I'm asking you to do. If you're full of ideas, if you're full of good things, I'm asking you to pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. Why? I'm telling you, more will be poured in, poured in, poured in. Next, when you do pour out, you become bigger. It's not like a glass that stays the same. Human beings have the ability to grow in consciousness and awareness and capacity. It's unlimited capacity. I found out kids don't lack capacity. In Europe, the kids speak what? Two, three, four, five, six languages. When I grew up, my father spoke German, never taught me. My mother spoke French, never taught me. They were trying to get away from all the old world languages back then. 
had no concept how valuable languages were going to be in the future. Just didn't know. So they abandoned the German, abandoned the French. I could have learned all three languages instead of just English. My girls went to high school, went to school in Beverly Hills. They've turned that around. In first grade now in Beverly Hills school system, they offer three languages besides English, French and German, Spanish. Why? Because kids can learn two languages just as easy as one. Question, how many languages can a child learn? Here's how many. As many as you'll take the time to teach them. They do not lack capacity. They only lack teachers. Wow. And I'm telling you the same thing as with you. You don't lack capacity. But here's how you expand your capacity. And that is to share what you've got. Now you get bigger. Share some more. Now you get bigger. I'm here for a very self-interest reason. If I share with you, my consciousness grows. If I share with you, I get to hear this again. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, Mr. Ron, how are you doing with all this stuff? You get on everybody's case pretty hard. How are you doing with all this stuff you teach? I said, well, best I can share with you is this. Listen to me very carefully, but don't watch me too close. <laughs> this stuff's easier to lecture on than it is to do. I understand that. I'm working on it just like you. But hey, pour out what you've got so that your capacity grows. Now, why should you want your capacity to grow? Very self-interest reason, here it is, to hold more of the next experience. You mean to tell me that sitting in this audience, some people will get more out of it than others? And the answer is yes. If you haven't been into expanding your own capacity lately, you might not get much from this seminar. But if you've been into expanding your capacity, and you've been sharing and you've been doing all this stuff, I'm telling you, no telling what all this could mean to you today, this chance to grow, change, develop, absorb, take in. I'm asking you to expand and grow so you can hold more of the next experience. Some people can't be very happy. You could pour happiness out on the whole world. Some people can't be very happy. Why? They're not big enough. If you're small, you don't get much. Small in comprehension, small in the ability to think and wonder, small in appreciation, no matter how much is poured out. Prosperity can be poured out on the whole country. Some people don't get much, why? They're too small, too small in their thinking, too small in their ability to share, have not expanded to their full capacity. Don't be like that. Now, some people aren't gonna get much because they've got their cup turned upside down. You couldn't put anything in. Learn to share. It's a glorious, glorious experience. Okay, enough on personal development. Let's cover now setting goals. Let me show you something that turned me every way but loose. I've never been the same since I found out about it. Learning how to set goals. Not long after I met Mr. Shelf, we're having breakfast one morning. Mr. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, now that we've gotten acquainted, we know each other fairly well, he said, maybe one of the best ways I can help you, he said, let me see your current list of goals. Let's go over them and talk about it. And I said, what? I don't have a list. He said, well, Mr. Owen, if you don't have a list of your goals, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars which he did, and that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. So that day I became a student of setting goals, and I've used it to dynamically affect my life. I've taught it to some of my business colleagues. We use it to do business around the world. Setting goals. It can turn out to be a drama for your life. Here's what goals are. Your vision of the future your vision of the future. Now there's two ways to face the future. One, with apprehension. Number two, with anticipation. Guess how most people face the future? With apprehension. Why? Major reason why. They don't have it well designed. They've left the design of their future to somebody else. 
And if you don't make plans of your own, guess what? You'll probably fall into someone else's plans. Guess what someone else may have planned for you? Not much. You got to make a list of this not much stuff. I'm telling you, people all their lives count on this not much list. If all of your negative relatives all turn positive, what will that do for your future? Not much. If prices come down a little, what will that do for your future? Not much. If the economy gets a little better, what will that do for your future? Not much. If circumstances get a little better, what will that do? Not much. If the weather gets a little better over the next few years, that'll do. Not much. I mean, you can go right down this whole scenario list. Most people all their lives with their fingers crossed count on this not much list. That's why 10 years from now, they'll be driving what they don't want to drive, living where they don't want to live, wearing what they don't want to wear, doing what they don't want to do, having what they don't want to have, maybe become what they didn't want to become. And it all starts by counting on something that's not going to count much. You say, well, then how can my life dramatically change? You got to count on yourself. And here's one of the things you got to count on your ability to design the future. It's called the promise. And the promise of the future, if you'll design it well, can have an awesome effect on your life. But if you face the future with apprehension, you'll take hesitant steps all day, uncertain steps all day. And if you take uncertain steps all day for six years, you can imagine how empty your life can be. We've got to help our kids with the promise of the future. Now, here's what's connected to the promise, the price, the price to pay. But I'm telling you, the price is easy if the promise is clear one of the better notes to make for today. The price is easy if the promise is clear and powerful. But the price seems almost too much to pay, too much to get over, too much to accomplish if the promise isn't clear, if the promise isn't powerful. I'm telling you, kids will pay the disciplines if they can see the promise. One of our biggest challenges as parents in the 90s is to help our kids see the promise of the future. That's why I'm teaching financial independence how to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and unique. All of the stuff kids would hope to go for. It's all possible. This is America. That's the promise of the future. The price, a few simple disciplines practiced every day. And I'm telling you, the kids will pay the price of the simple disciplines if they can see the promise of the future. But if they can't see, they don't want to pay. And the same is true of all of us. We will pay the most extraordinary disciplines if we can see the promise of the future called setting goals. So I'm asking you to get a handle on the future. I'm asking you not to leave it to anyone else. Not, don't leave it to the company. The company's got their own goals. I'm asking you to set your own goals, your personal goals, income goals and financial goals and health goals and spiritual goals. And where do you want to go and what do you want to do and what do you want to see and what do you want to be? That's it. Promise of the future. Design your own future. It's within your hands and your capacity to do so. Here's how simple now goal setting is. It's not mysterious. You don't have to anchor. You don't have to focus. You don't have to visualize. None of that stuff. Here's how simple goal setting is. Change my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down. Make a list. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? What skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do, ordinary things you'd like to do, right? Silly little things you'd like to do, very important things you'd like to do. Decide, decide on all that stuff and write it down, write it down, write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private list. If it's really private, you know, on your list, put some stuff in code where nobody can understand it. If this list fell into unfriendly hands, and simple things, whatever, foolish things, doesn't matter, it's your list. I had a little revenge on my first list. Budget finance, who used to harass me. I got two or three payments behind this one guy called incessantly. Said, we're gonna come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. Put me down something fierce. When I met Shof, got my life straightened out, one of the first things on one of my lists was budget finance. And when I finally got the money, I needed a little drama. 
in my life. Finally got the money to pay them off. I put it in small bills in a big briefcase. Walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his desk was about three back. I opened the door, walked in right up to his desk, stood right in front of him, never said a word. He said, well, what are you doing here? Didn't say a word. I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over his desk. I said, count it. It's all there. I'll never be back. Turned around, walked out, slammed the door. Now that might not be noble, but you got to try it at least one time. Pay off with a little drama. Got to check them off my list. Keep your list with you. I keep my list in my journal so that I can go back. Five years ago, here was my list and I'm a little embarrassed. Here's what I thought was so important now how my philosophy has changed from 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Here's my old list. Here's my new list. Here's what's valuable to me now. Here's what I want my life to be now. Here's where I want to go, what I want to do, what I want to see. Keep your lists of goals so that it shows your growth, shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands what's valuable. Setting goals. It doesn't matter how small foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. Thought that was... I like that. Have you got this profound thing now on setting goals? Here's how profound it is. Decide what you want, and write it down. Get together with your wife, decide. Get together with your kids, decide. Get together with your business colleagues, decide, write it down, make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is.